find that if somebody leaves and then returns, uh, sometimes those uh, things get reset and uh, that's sometimes the solution. Okay, it looks like we're getting some positive comments that they can hear us. Tom, okay. I think we should get going. I am seeing- okay. Great, well, questions. thank you, thank you, Zayla, that's great. Well, welcome to the uh, webinar hosted by uh, Catholic Investment Services. Thank you for joining us today. Our topic is a timely one, which is where to invest in a low rate environment. My name is Tom Langto, and I'm privileged to serve as Chief Executive Officer of Catholic Investment Services. My colleague, Zayla Estargin, who has done a great job organizing this program, is at the Zoom control panel. Enormous thanks to our accomplished panel, who will be introduced shortly. Today's format will be conversational. There'll be time for audience questions after the formal part of the program. So please use the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen, not the chat feature, this Q&A feature on your Zoom screen to submit question at any time during the call. Our audience is muted and the program is being recorded. Catholic Investment Services was founded by some of the investment industry's most respected leaders to address the investment challenges faced by Catholic organizations. We are a nonprofit serving other Catholic nonprofits. We hope this webinar provides you some useful take home value. Zayla provided biographical information for our speakers, but I wanna emphasize a few highlights. We have a very sophisticated audience today, and I think you'll agree that our panel is more than equal to the task. Jack Brennan is familiar to many of you through his many noteworthy leadership roles, including as a founder of CIS and the founding chair of our board. You may not know that uh, about 18 years ago, Jack wrote an almost best-selling book called Straight Talk on Investing. If you know Jack, it is Straight Talk, which he has recently updated and is now available for pre-order on Amazon. As with the original version, Jack is donating all, the, donating all the proceeds from the sale of the new book to a nonprofit supporting early childhood education. Like Jack, Ted DiCibato has a highly accomplished investment industry track record, and it's packed a lot into uh, his 34 year career. Pairing a degree in chemical engineering with a Wharton MBA, Ted uses his STEM brain as a powerful and effective uh, advocate for and trusted advisor to his clients. We at CIS appreciate the constructive and thoughtful way that Ted serves our common clients. Jack and Ted, thank you for both, both for contributing your time. Jack, of course, had no choice. Uh, <laughs> talent and experience today. You both have lots of years of, of service and your experience perspectives will be especially valuable to our audience. Now, before we start our conversation, please join me in a short prayer. Dear God, please grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Please specially bless all those whose lives have been so disrupted by the pandemic and help those of us who are merely inconvenienced realize how lucky we are. Amen. All right, Jack, Amen. you're going to tee it up. Great, Tom. Thank you very much. And uh, Zayla, thank you for the great organization of this. And thanks to the whole audience for joining us. Um, uh, my only uh, real role here is to pick Ted's brain. And we've had a chance to have a couple of conversations and it, it's gonna be a fast paced time. But as Tom said at the beginning, I think a very topical subject that we're here about today. Um, uh, for s several of you, I know we're on our uh, semi-annual call uh, for Catholic Investments last week. And one of the charts we had in there is very revealing and it is uh, can be summarized as the fact that we are today sitting at uh, the end point of what is a 700 year bull market in interest rates. Uh, the Bank of England has gone back and to the chart that was in our deck last week showed that they go back to 1314 and rates were in the mid teens back then. And obviously they're not exactly the same rates, but interest rates were then. And today we sit at one or 2%. You know, more narrowly, uh, we, we were discussing earlier when I started my career in the summer of 1976, um, that the 10-year Treasury was about 7%, up from four, up from four 14 years earlier, so nearly a doubling in interest rates. And it was in the midst of a period of time where it had gone from four to seven, and between 76 and 81, that 10-year went to 15%. 
Uh, Ted and I know the expression that bonds were known as certificates of confiscation uh, back then. And um, there's another example, another expression I, I read uh, just yesterday, which was it was a period of return free risk. Exactly. It was a set. Sorry, Ted. I was saying it was exactly right. And and oh, by the way, no one wanted to buy 30 year treasuries with a 15% guaranteed rate of return. Um, they were afraid they were going to go to 20. So everybody was underweight those securities and uh, missed out on most of that opportunity. And imagine today if you could get a guaranteed 30 year 15% rate of return uh, to fund your liabilities. Exactly. And at that point was the start of a 39-year bull market, if you smooth it enough. It's been a 39-year bull market in fixed income securities over, over time. Um, but to a point now where it's quite challenging. It's quite challenging. If you think about just from the low points last summer to um, in rates to where we are today, a 10-year bond, treasury bond, has lost 8% value. And in essence, all of the income, you more than all of the income you would have earned by holding that bond for 10 years between July and February. A 30-year bond's lost 22% of its value over that same period of time from a 1% increase in rates, essentially, roughly. And it's because the durations are so long and there's so little income to protect you uh, in, in that math. So it's it's why we're particularly happy to uh, have have Ted here to talk about you know he he spends his career helping fiduciaries be successful in their important roles and our job at Catholic Investment Services is to help fiduciaries be successful in their roles. We're very grateful to consultants like Ted who help us get smarter and who advise uh, mutual clients and so I, I just thought it would be worthwhile Ted to talk about you already made one comment about it you know who wants a treasury that might go from fifteen to twenty. Uh, back in the early 80s. Um, just talk about maybe in the context, uh, your your perspective as you sit here at the end of February 2021, but in the context of having been through spikes in interest rates, but a secular bull market through most of your career in fixed income and and some of the macro challenges you see for your clients and for people like uh, who, are, who are listening in today. Uh, I'd be really interested in, uh, in your point of view. Sure, that's great. Um... Let me start by saying it's great to work with you again. You know, in this challenging world of video conversations, uh, um, you never seem to age. So I'm. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. it's uh, good news uh, for that. The rest of us don't have that benefit. Um, I think the, the viewers and, uh, you know, we have quite an audience uh, uh, that have registered for this uh, webinar, one of the most. Um, and... Uh, I think we should start out why we are in this current environment. You know, why after a thousand years of the 250 uh, glorious years of this republic, why do we find ourselves in 2020 at these uh, low yield environment? And, um, you know, there are three major reasons that uh, researchers have pinned this on. Uh, one is population growth, and sometimes people call that uh, demographics our destiny. Uh, this debt overhang that has been building up in the developed world for some years and um, globalization of opportunity. It's not so much that uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, is not uh, competitive, but the rest of the world is becoming more competitive. And now I'll ask the audience, how likely is any of those three major factors that have been pinned for these uh, low rates to change. Probably we're not going to see much change in uh, population in the developed world, and um, uh, the debt overhang is uh, is not going to be easily resolved. And in fact, it's getting a bit worse. And um, uh, globalization uh, and and moving some of those uh, growth opportunities that used to be here overseas. Um, so if those things are going to stick around, probably low yields are here. Now, we're going to see a lifting up, getting back to maybe where the normal uh, two or three percent is on a 10-year treasury. And as Jack indicated, you know, there's going to be some money lost in bonds, but uh, only two or three percent on fixed income or risk mitigating assets is a challenge, and it, and it will be a challenge. So that's where we're starting from, uh, a challenging environment. And um, 
uh, it, it's going to be difficult to get uh, better. You know, one of one of the things that you see today, Ted, is real yields are negative. It's hard to it's hard to know what inflation is. Um, right. But give or give or take, real yields are break even or negative. Uh, does that worry you? And again, I'm always thinking about our clients who, you know, if they're a foundation, they need to pay out five percent. And if you're a high school or a university or a hospital system, you're probably drawing or our, the dogma is that we you draw five percent um, and you throw some inflation on top of it. Um, are there is there are there signals in your mind about real yields being yeah. not particularly attractive, even when you're taking some risk to get them? Well, clearly they've gotten worse, not better. And um, so I, let, let's address that in two parts. Uh, the first part being uh, where we see inflation. And if you study inflation carefully over the last uh, four or five years, it's been mostly moving around with changes in energy prices. Um, now, uh, we've had this dramatic increase in money. Uh, there's no monetarist left. There's certainly no supply <laughs> side, uh, uh, side economics left. Uh, everybody's a Keynesian, uh, but it would seem like uh, the future for inflation, if you had to take an under or over, you'd, uh, you'd bet on the over. Uh, but there are those three factors that I just described, low population, globalization, debt overhang, and many of the studies that have been done would indicate that um, uh, inflation is low, but we are fortunate in the current environment that we have a market for future inflation. And uh, nice. we look at the uh, price difference between tips and US treasuries and the market is saying inflation is gonna be low for a long period of time. Um, the purpose of this uh, webinar is to really help people think through uh, the alternatives. I think you have to play with the cards that were dealt the cards we're currently dealt with are low environment, low inflation, low growth. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later in this uh, webinar about the risks of inflation picking up, uh, but um, we won't be alone in having these low real yields. And so you, for, for endowments and foundations that have a fixed uh, spending uh, vehicle, uh, their liabilities are probably growing at inflation. And uh, that's gonna be a challenge, especially with fixed income yielding below what maybe their costs are increasing. Um, and uh, uh, my comment is that we'll ju just add that to the deck of cards as one of the challenges uh, that we all face. Yeah, and that's, that's such a good point. You know, it, it, you, can, you can wish something different, but we are where we are, right? You know, the, the, the 10 years yields one four. Stocks are pretty highly valued. So, but the question is, what do you do? You know, you could sit and you can't wish it away, right? Hope isn't a strategy, as they say. And and uh, let me, let me ask one other though, one other thing uh, as a background matter before we get to sort of how do we think about what you do with this hand? Um, one of the roles that actually uh, fixed income has played quite well, uh, even at this the, these declining yields over the last uh, say this century, a pretty decent diversifier. Um, during spikes uh, downward in, in equities, which is the other engine for, you know, for growth, obviously. Um, and it's fun to look at charts where you, look, you watch correlation. Are they inversely correlated? Are they positively correlated? From these levels, uh, you know, if you think about income as one, one way, one reason you own fixed income, diversification benefits is the other. Is there value, is fixed income's value as a, uh, Diversifier as a source of risk reduction, portfolio risk reduction diminished greatly when you're at yields like we are today in your view? Yeah, so that's the heart of the issue. Um, uh, you know, uh, we're going to talk about this 60 40 portfolio of 60, uh, and, and uh, we're really going to focus on the 40% that's uh, risk mitigating assets. It used to be 60 stocks and 40 bonds. Now it's uh, some other things, and we're, we're going to talk in a moment about the functional equivalent uh, of that. Uh, but um, the best estimate for future returns on fixed income over its duration is what its current yield is. So if uh, one and a half percent is on the 10-year treasury and there's some spread, historically low, by the way, 
for most right. credit assets. Uh, not much in terms of taking duration risk. Um, uh, you, you'd have to come to a conclusion that you're not going to get the kind of diversification or offsetting a risk that you've seen in the past with core fixed income. So it doesn't mean you abandon it entirely, but one of the first conclusions of this uh, webinar would be, uh, it is appropriate to take some move. Uh, we can, uh, for each client that's gonna be different, for each investor, it's gonna be different, but some move uh, from core, traditional core fixed income to other assets to, uh, uh, is justified based on the factors you just described. And it's funny, it makes life more complicated than it was in another era where you could, you know, the, there was such great inverse relationship and, you know, if the stocks got to a certain earnings yield, you bought them. And if they got below a certain earnings yield, you, you, you move to fixed income. And life was pretty simple 40 years ago in, uh, in many ways, but we didn't have the alternatives to either, either that are available today to try to make, um, to, to, to try to do different things for different, different client uh, needs either. Sure. So one of the things that we did is at the end of last year, we uh, surveyed um, a group of academic sell-side research institutions, um, uh, investment firms to really uh, find out what uh, the investment industry was doing with this uh, low yield, low growth environment. And during this webinar, you and I are going to discuss sort of what the industry thinks. We'll also, uh, we, you know, we might provide our own opinions, but I think it'll be most useful to participants to really understand what the broad thought is about this environment and what, uh, what are the right steps to take. Because at the end of this webinar, we want a list of things that these fiduciaries should be looking at, maybe bringing back to their committees and saying, uh, here, here are three or four things uh, that uh, Jack and Ted talked about that we should be thinking about. Let's go right there. That the piece you guys wrote on the industry's views was outstanding. Uh, not not to Thank not you. to shine your shoes, but uh, uh, they've done uh, the the firm has done some really interesting work. Written uh, not for Chicago PhDs, but for normal people. And uh, yeah, go go right there. I think it would be sure. really interesting and helpful for the audience to to hear what you. And then I I, I do want to get to the kind of concept you guys have produced as well about a barbell approach and then we'll get a little more specific. Sure. So uh, by the way, most of that uh, research is available online um, uh, at uh, makita.com under thought leadership. So uh, anybody can go to that website and you don't have to register. You can just go ahead and uh, download that. But let's start out with this historical 60-40 portfolio. It's, it's just a framework around which to think about it. And, um, you know, years ago when you and I started, uh, Jack, it was 60 in stocks and 40 in bonds. And, um, you know, you might have divided that into large cap and small cap and international stocks and then maybe different kinds of fixed income. Um, I think it's most useful for clients. And by the way, that framework is still valid and it's appropriate. Um, but uh, it uh, is uh, um, worthwhile to think more functionally and say, what am I going to do with my risk seeking assets? If we can replace the 60% on that and the risk mitigation assets, or maybe even more useful is um, how do I seek return with growth assets, income assets, alternative assets, liquidity assets, and what we're going to advocate uh, and what the industry really is advocating is that uh, investors take some money from those income assets, which maybe don't have the same degree of diversification or income, uh, and move it to some of those other asset classes. We can also discuss, well, what do we do with the volatility and the growth assets given high valuations and all, but we'll handle that in a few minutes. Um, the question is, do we live with these low returns and just accept them? Uh, and uh, uh, is there the diversification benefit to offset the risk uh, assets enough to justify? And I think the industry has come to the conclusion that no, uh, although fixed income is still valuable um, and it does provide some diversification, it also is probably uh, you should be looking at other alternatives uh, than uh, in that risk mitigating bucket. 
Yeah, it, it said that the, uh, the, the the functional framework is a really interesting one in many ways because you know one of one of the uh, you know in a world where we're not very much involved that we don't have many clients here, but you may in the pension world when you look when you watch. Uh, you watch the earning the rate the earnings assumptions inherent in financial statements on you know the smaller and smaller number of certainly corporate pension plans uh, they're still pretty high numbers when you're you know you're looking at sevens and seven and a halves and uh, you've got to go find some uh, return in your risk seeking you hope and and smooth it as best you can with the risk mitigating uh, in 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 many ways and even though a pension plan is different. It's not that different a challenge than a traditional foundation or endowment that sure. wants to draw four and a half to five and a half and two percent inflation, and you're still getting yourself near seven a seven percent return. And you know, course, there's a lot. Um, of, uh, of course, many uh, faith-based organizations have retirement plans as well as endowments that they have to totally. be concerned about. Totally, and and sometimes with a demographic that is uh, that is aging, challenging. And, uh, it's very challenging. It, it's yeah. very challenging. Um, you know, there are a lot of things out there as in the alternatives category um, that you see, you know, uh, one of the things that I've, I've come around to believing a high yield bond with a 4% yield is an oxymoron, right? I mean, it just doesn't, you know, and in another era that felt like something that I, when it had, when there were spreads of six, seven, 10%, maybe that was viable. Um, how, how do you think, just to stay within the fixed income world, sure. treasuries, we know where they are, spreads are tight. Are they, is that where you're thinking you, you, you take some credit risk or, or, or do you go, there are other categories we'll talk about, but uh, do you go further afield than reduction in credit or extension in maturity, if sure. you will, to try sure. to pick up? So uh, uh, let's address that question directly by saying, uh, why are we at historically low spreads? You know, maybe there was a few times uh, that we've been close to this, but investment grade uh, spreads, and that just means the premium that you you get for taking some credit risk, whether it's investment grade or high yield, um, are near their historic lows. And um, so why do we find ourselves in that environment? Well, there are two factors. I just re recited three of them regarding the structure of low interest rates. Um, and you can't ignore, since the global financial crisis, the significant intervention by the Federal Reserve and uh, now the, the federal government. Um, liquidity is abundant um, and uh, uh, people are searching for yield. Uh, there hasn't been the constraint on the ability of borrowers to get credit. Um, they haven't, uh, investors haven't uh, demanded those higher yields. Uh, there hasn't been a cause for it. Um, so we find ourselves dependent on uh, not only um, the factors that I described before, uh, but also this government intervention. Uh, so the Federal Reserve did all their work during the global financial crisis. They're kind of tapped out. Uh, the, the US uh, government has now stepped in. Uh, and uh, I think everybody on the call probably has seen the chart of M1 and what that has done. And uh, we'll, we're going to learn what the factors are related to that. But so you find yourself in this low spread, low yield environment. And uh, again, that's the card that's de dealt. Um, unlikely, it appears that uh, there's going to be a whole lot of positive end result, because when you're buying spreads at historic lows, it's a little bit like being on the mountain, right? Every, every, every direction is down. <laughs> no, that, that that that's right, and uh, I have to admit, I, I um, my academic mentor was a uh, was Milton Friedman's best friend, so I'm a big believer in monetarist policies, and so I I I look at this data and it scares me, and and uh, and there are a whole bunch of mitigating factors, but the the expansion of the money supply and and it, it just. Uh, I worry about inflation. I just I worry that it's going to come back and yeah. Reality. So I, I think you're more sanguine, maybe. The debate of uh, of the of the decade here is going to be: Are we going to look like Japan or um, Argentina? And I think you and I have discussed this in the past that I don't think it's going to be either one of those. You know, we have some uh, characteristics, but. Um, it will be a challenge. And um, so let's turn our attention to why this uh, challenge. So we've already let, laid the stage for 
why there's no real advantage of taking duration risk or credit risk. Let's briefly talk about the risk part of the portfolio. Um, everybody has probably seen the major investment firms, consulting firms uh, uh, with their forecasts of uh, returns for risky assets. Um, when you combine that, um, you know, maybe you're gonna get four to 5%. So if your spending rate is 5%, uh, the, the viewers of this uh, call are going to have to make a decision. Do I spend some principal? Because over the next 10 years, I'm probably not going to get to my 5%. Um, uh, or do I lower my spending rate? Do I take more risk in the risk-seeking bucket? Um, and all of those will be questions we'll try to address briefly on this call. You know, it's a, it, it emphasizes this is a point that that's so important and you do in your practice which is um how important strategy is whatever the pool of capital whether it's your 401k plan in retirement or you know a, a hospital systems pension plan uh and and you know there are tactics underneath the strategy but the, these strategic decisions i think if there's one message people take away from this call that there's a lot of environmentals that i would argue mandate uh, the, this is a time where you step back and ask, what is your strategy as the, as the fiduciary overseers of a pool of capital? Don't you think it's even more compelling than normal today? Sure, it's a great thing. Every Everybody uh, sitting at that uh, table is going to ask, now, wait, let me get this right. I'm going to get a 5% return and a 17% standard deviation. Come on, I, there must be something better. You, you must have a solution. Um, that uh, we used to get 5% in a money market fund, and now you're predicting 5% on uh, US equities and uh, uh, no diminution of variability. And so uh, I think in this case, uh, there's a solution. You're going to have to accept lower returns on your risk assets with the same degree of variability, but you're now going to have to implement operational oversight in order to uh, compensate for that. So let's talk about the barbell approach that you have in one of your other papers that is very thoughtful and thought and, and intriguing, uh, uh, a, a practical approach to thinking about this. Um, again, this, uh, this is in a paper, I, th I think it's the one called a conversation now moving towards a new portfolio framework. If people want to go out to the Makita, it's really interesting. Just uh, sure. uh, it, it's great thinking and um, and provocative. I think from for people who are used to a somewhat more traditional view of the world. Yeah. So yeah, uh, talk, so, talk about it. Uh, so just to clarify, for many on the calls, as soon as they start he hearing about a barbell strategy, they might think of short and long duration bonds, right? And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about. Um, looking at maybe uh, risk-seeking assets and uh, taking sufficient risk. Um, uh, we think the, the federal government is going to stay involved, and so we can use some of that support in order to uh, take appropriate amounts of risk and then barbell that with a allocation to risk-mitigating strategies that offset that risk. Now, that's going to be a challenging uh, alternative set of alternatives there, um, but uh, it's it's a one approach to what and and really it gets down to this: um, you should play the cards you're dealt with your risk mitigating strategies. You're going to need to accept the higher degree of variability there. Maybe reserve in your risk mitigating strategies a higher level part of the barbell of your spending rate. Uh, so that you can live through the variability that is inherent with high valuations. Um, and so when you're sitting at that table and making judgments about the strategy that usually you're outsourcing to uh, investment firms of uh, one sort or another, or your internal staff, and you're providing review of the internal staff regarding their strategy, um, you, uh, there's part of it you're going to need to accept, and part of it you shouldn't. And uh, probably it's the risk mitigating part that the math is clear. Uh, there's no way at a one and a half percent 10 year yield, you can magically turn that into a 7% rate of return. And um, that's the one area that 
uh, because what, what, what you would normally do in this environment is say, okay, if my risk assets are riskier for lower return, uh, maybe we ought to put some more assets in risk mitigating strategies and you need to be thoughtful and creative uh, uh, about that. Let, let me pick up on that for a second uh, in terms of the risk side of things. Um, Tom mentioned this uh, book I wrote a long time ago and have re rewritten. And it's fun to look at a book 18 years later and say, what's changed over the 18 years? And the good news is most of it hasn't changed. The core principles haven't changed, but certain things have. And one of which is um, the availability of private assets today to smaller institutions and even individuals at this stage. And you know, we could spend, we could do another one of these for three hours on, on private equity and the shrinkage sure. in the U.S. equity markets and so on and so forth. But um, as one approach to maybe enhancing returns or trying to enhance returns a bit on your risk-seeking assets, uh, uh, how do you think about how privates play a role? And by the way, uh, full disclosure, we're, we have, uh, we're in our second uh, impact investing private equity fund uh, yeah. is being under right now for CIS. How, how do you think about it? I know it's I know it's challenging. Some clients yeah. are nervous about it, the illiquidity or I don't understand it. But it does feel like it's a it's a way with comparable risk, hopefully, to to try to enhance a return a little bit. But what's your what's your reaction to that for from a client standpoint? Yeah. So let's go back to that industry thought process regarding private uh, assets. And we should talk about it both inside the risk uh, seeking a bucket and the risk mitigating bucket, you know, private income oriented. Uh, so let's uh, deal with uh, the private equity part of it. Um, you, you, if uh, if you study where the industry is right now on uh, public equities, you see that they're in this four or five percent range. Now, I, I will grant you there's a few people that are much lower than that, uh, not too many above that uh, range. Uh, there's still a few uh, that have a negative uh, expected rate of return over the next uh, uh, 10 years. And you, you would want to be mindful of that, but uh, don't necessarily uh, uh, justify that by, by making a significant change to your equity uh, portfolio. You will also notice that nearly every firm is suggesting higher returns for private equity investments. Uh, now, what do you think that's going to do to capital flows? Well, it's going to lower the, lower the expected returns okay. when capital more capital chasing less for sure. less opportunity. Sure. So it doesn't mean that private equity is not an important thing, but don't think that there's a magic solution to get your seven percent return. Mm -hmm. Think in terms of spread over what your expectation is for for public equities. I encourage everybody to read Steve Kaplan's work out of the University of Chicago, who has really owns the axe on. Uh, uh, evaluation of private equity versus uh, cash flow. Um, and his work is great. Uh, uh, it's often quoted uh, in the industry. Uh, so uh, in your risk budget, you should be putting more into private investments. That probably makes sense. Uh, there are opportunities there, but not for the reason you think. The reason it's there is that those companies tend to be a little more leveraged, a little smaller, the opportunity to grow, and in a low growth, low return environment, prudent leverage and investing in things that have a prudent degree of leverage is important. You may notice in the news that some of the large uh, public state uh, pension fund systems are considering how to put leverage on a 5% return in order to uh, get a higher return. Well, you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, you can do it through things like private equity and inherently those uh, companies have that opportunity set associated with it. So moderate your thought uh, regarding what the return possibility is. Think a little prudent leverage and that will lead you to making an appropriate allocation to private equity. Very helpful. I'm going to ask you one more, and then we're going to take it. We've got, I've got a few questions here from the audience, but I want to ask you, let's flip to the um, risk mitigating side at some level here. And, you know, a couple of places that, um, you know, real estate is a place that somehow, I'm not sure New York, New York, tall New York office buildings is one you want to own, but uh, yeah. you know, real estate's a huge market. 
largely private, more you know, increasingly public through REITs and other things. But um, you know, posted yields are actually pretty attractive. Some of that's return of capital over time. But do you think of again, if you're thinking private-ish, less liquid? Um, do you think real estate as an option for um, trying to get a little more out of your risk mitigating is is a viable uh, thing for our investors and clients to think about? Sure, and and so when you're looking at your uh, the basic yield structure, the time structure of interest rates, keep that in mind and say, ask yourself, what risks am I willing to take to get a higher income return? Uh, you and I just discussed the fact that taking credit risk is a difficult environment, not only because spreads are low, but as you noted, we're at historically high levels of debt in the system, especially borrowing by corporations. And just look at the curves of uh, debt issuance. And uh, we have this unique combination of low yields and high debt issuance, uh, an amazing uh, set of circumstances. So uh, uh, if you're just taking credit risk, uh, maybe that doesn't uh, make sense. And you ought to look at other cyclical opportunities like real estate, infrastructure, that's part of our bell, barbell strategy of saying, uh, you know, take a little out of core income and look at the yield opportunities in um, real estate and infrastructure. And I will say this, the market needs to reassess proper valuations in the real estate market. And uh, you, you wanna be careful about that, but usually those things happen over a period of time and mm -hmm. uh, you know you 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 would begin on this journey, uh, and this journey should take you maybe a little less credit risk, a little less uh, um, government uh, debt risk, and a little bit more in these real estate and uh, infrastructure areas. One, one more, more comment, on if I may, sure. regarding that. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, consistent with uh, when you study the industry, um, the industry is also saying to have a significant allocation to private credit. Uh, by the way, private equity and private credit are two sides of the same coin. Whenever I, I said private equity includes some leverage while well, somebody else is providing that debt. Exactly, uh, a bunch of guys in Chicago, actually, it seems to be the hub of the private credit yeah. market. Yeah. So is it sensible to take some private uh, credit? Um, I think there's some disintermediation occurring in the banking industry. And can clients step into that void and do some of that private lending? Uh, I think there's an opportunity there. So when you look at your risk mitigating assets, um, prudently consider the taking a little illiquidity risk, a little cyclical industry risk, maybe a little private debt risk. Um, and uh, those would be prudent in this environment. One other one that's um, when it's good, it's good. When it's bad, is awful. Um, absolute return. Yeah. Uh, it, it's uh, and there are some people have done it well. Generically, it hasn't been a particularly attractive space. Um, but I'm guessing that our uh, uh, participants in the call will get pitched by the ones whose yeah. trailing record is pretty good. How, how do you and the firm think yeah. of absolute return? Is that a yeah. viable uh, risk mitigating strategy with re decent returns or yeah. is it something to stay away from? Well, we try to ask clients to stay away from the term absolute return because it conveys yep. that there is such a thing as uh, somebody- uh, Healing CD. Yeah, yeah. The absolute returns are CDs and they're a half a percent. So uh, right. that, that's what the absolute return is. Um, but there are alternative ways of creating um, value. So uh, let, let's talk about that. We, we, we just described what the right way is of dealing with risk mitigating assets with your um, uh, risk seeking assets. But we suggested moving a little bit of money out of that risk mitigating bucket to this area of alternative investments. And what that means is uh, instead of just taking exposure to the market, the, what the industry calls beta risk, that there's other ways of uh, getting risk uh, and getting returns. And um, the bar is now set low for fixed income. So maybe there's an opportunity that, and you've described it, uh, that it's been a challenging environment. 
Um, the biggest hedge funds, uh, you know the names of them all, have had some of their worst years in 2020. Um, I think you can set that aside. I, I believe that their principles of uh, what they're trying to accomplish are still valid. And I will say since November, you've seen a dramatic improvement in that area. So I'm influenced by this. Uh, uh, for those uh, students of what's going on in alternative investments, it's a new spring occurring uh, in November <laughs> uh, here in the first quarter. And I'll, I'll base that on the fact that I think it's reasonable. So moving some assets from risk mitigating to uh, uh, alternative assets, and, and we'll use the term hedge funds uh, that try to take both sides of the market. Um, they were surprised by what happened in January with the short squeeze, but there's still some opportunity there. So I'm gonna, uh, we've had a couple of questions come in on inflation and I hope we've uh, addressed those for you in the course of the conversation. But there's one that I wanna pick up uh, right after that because I, I hear it all the time in various settings and I'm sure you hear it a lot more than I do, which is um, uh, that often there are Finance committee, investment committee members who have a negative, uh, have a significant number of uh, members who have a negative reaction to either or both the term hedge funds and alternative assets. Yeah. Um, I think you've done a nice job of explaining it, Ted, but help one of our uh, participants uh, answer that question to, to, to mitigate, to reduce fear at least, if not eliminate it uh, with the titles. Well, um, I will say this they're right to be skeptical. Um, so one of the things you need to talk to your committee about is, is it reasonable to take investment manager risk? When you take a indexed approach to the U.S. equity market, there's no manager risk or very little of it, especially if you select Vanguard. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but um, uh, hedge funds, there's little market risk, but a whole lot of execution and manager risk. So there's only one way to mitigate that risk, and it's by diversifying. You clearly don't want to, especially for a smaller institute, really for anybody, pick one hedge fund and expect that that operational risk will be mitigated in some way. You, you really need to spread your risk. So the, my response to that would be uh, encourage that board member uh, that they're right uh, it is a risky thing and explain why in this low yield environment, it's right to take a little investment manager risk, a little active management risk versus beta risk, because there's no return for the beta risk in the stock market or the core fixed income market. Great, great. The couple of inflation questions I thought I'd just address. Um, if Ted's described strategies to try to get real return here. But one of the things that uh, he alluded to earlier and I've alluded to, you know, getting the fiscal side of the house in order is is more important today in many ways, you know, than than it's ever been because of the prospective returns. And so, you know, there'll always be temptation to just raise the draw off the pool of capital a little bit for a capital project or something I need. And that is spending the seed corn. And, and, and it's... It's really challenging, and if there's one thing, one message that I think is so important for you know the investment side is unknown. If it can control the spending side a little bit and be disciplined about how you evaluate that, whether it's a three-year roll that you're going to use as your benchmark for uh, the draw, but you know, and in. Now is the time you want to be thinking about taking five to four and a half because it's going to be harder to get there. And, you know, the most sophisticated uh, investment committees are doing that and, and, and financial staffs. But it's true for an individual and it's true for it's true for sure. that for um, for the institutions. Don't you agree? Yeah. So saying that exactly the way you did, uh, if the next 10 year rate of return is going to be. 50 to 60 to 80 basis points lower, you probably need, look back and whatever your average spending rate was and you're satisfied with it, think you're gonna have to cut that spending rate by 50 to 80 basis points because that's the return that you're gonna get. And you'll see the industry averages come down uh, by that amount. Um, 
Uh, and the best way to do that is do a scenario analysis, you know, find out how your liabilities react to low returns, find out what uh, the flexibility is on your spending rate. But uh, either you have to expect your corpus of the endowment is going to fall to keep your spending rate the same, and you need to analyze that, or you need to cut your spending rate by 50 basis points because the next decade is going to have 50 basis points of lower returns. Another question for you. I'm sure you get a lot of ESG questions. There's a specific one about climate risk. Um, and if you're evaluating infrastructure investments, how do you think about climate risk against real estate and infrastructure? Uh, is yeah. it something that you know it's you factor in as you're thinking about what you recommend and so on? Yeah, so um, uh, it, that's a key issue. Um, I will say this. There's two things that I would recommend to everybody on the call. Um, one is uh, there's a great workshop on Laudato C um, out of the University of San Diego. They have, uh, in fact, one of their uh, workshops is tonight at 5.30. Uh, it helps you understand for a faith-based community uh, what one way of looking at that uh, structure is. Um, so I, I encourage everyone to, uh, to, to, to study those workshops. I think that's a, a great uh, foundational document uh, in Laudato C and, and uh, the update uh, to it. Uh, the second thing is, I would say that um, impact, there are opportunities to not just invest in infrastructure, but impact investment structure, um, solving water problems, solving climate problems, solving uh, inequality of income problems. And when you're looking at your infrastructure, you don't have to just look at airports and toll roads and, and ports. You can look at other forms of uh, infrastructure that will accomplish the goal that you're talking about. Let me, let me you, you, you began this by talking about inflation as well and, and infrastructure as an alternative. I'll say this, you can forget about inflation for the, for the next year, you know. Let's see if it happens. Uh, the Federal Reserve and the US government have said, we're not gonna allow interest rates to get out of bounds here. We're, we're not gonna allow inflation. The, the market is saying inflation is gonna be in control. The federal government is saying uh, inflation is gonna be under control. The Federal Reserve is saying they're gonna move to keep inflation under control. Um, uh, and uh, I think you can set that problem aside for the moment. I, and I don't mean to discount it isn't a significant problem, it is. But think about a, a little bit like Scarlett O'Hara. Think about that tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> right now, you need to deal with the low yields. Um, and let, let me make just one final comment as we're running out of time here. Um, uh, some will ask, well, Ted and, and Jack, what do you mean by low yield low growth environment. Aren't we hitting new highs in the new US stock market? Aren't, uh, didn't we get an 8% return on bond yields uh, last year? Aren't things moving in the right direction? What do you mean that we need to rethink this? Uh, well, the facts are looking forward that the math doesn't allow those things to be maintained. So uh, I granted things look pretty good now, but they won't. I think that's very well said. It's very well said. And, you know, the, particularly the stock market is not always linked to the economy, right? And, and where you're headed. And it's, it, it's, it's only all we had. One of the great parts about being in this business, right, is it's about that you can't do anything about the past. Exactly. And so it's always forward looking. And uh, I think your advice is, is, is spot on there. Um, I see Zayla and Tom pop up in our little picture here. So um, I'm going to do the most important thing I can do here, Ted, is thank you with great sincerity and uh, for a fascinating conversation, I have to say. And, and I hope our, uh, our participants found it uh, half as valuable as I did. Tons to think about great wisdom and experience. And, uh, you know, it's fun to be doing it. It's fun to be doing something like this at this point in time, because it's an inflection point at some level, uh, given where we are exactly. in, in interest rates. So thank you on behalf of uh, Catholic Investment Services. We're, okay. we're really grateful for your time. We're grateful for the way you help us become a better organization as sure. well and for your support of clients. And, and before we get into questions, let's, and we, we may not- I've already done the question. I've already done all the questions. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, let's summarize our prescription because we're in an environment where we've got a pandemic going on. Everybody is talking about inoculation. Uh, I'd like to talk about inoculating your asset allocation for the next decade. And so here's what Jack and I have described. Um, you should plan for lower returns. And the best way to do that is uh, make sure your staff or your vendors are conducting scenario analysis at these lower rate of returns. And whether that means you reduce your spending rate or not, well, that's up to you. Accept higher volatility for lower returns in your risk-seeking assets. Don't, there's, there's no way you're gonna solve that problem. The, the, the variability is gonna exist. Um, just make sure you can get through the period of time when assets are going down without having to liquidate them. Hold on uh, to more projected spending rate um, and your liquidity bucket. You know, if you need to transfer a couple more months or quarters of spending to your liquidity bucket, go ahead and do it. It's good now. We're hitting new highs. Spend a little of, uh, uh, and, and uh, mit mitigate some more risk. Move some assets to those alternative assets. It will allow you to prudently use leverage. Like George Bailey, at the end of the day, you're gonna have less cash in the bucket, uh, but uh, it probably is gonna produce uh, rates of return. Uh, the fifth point is think functional rather than um, uh, in the past about how much do I have in large, small, international. You, know, you need to think about the functionality of your investments and uh, then study uh, what, what's going on in the industry. The best returns are always thinking different from the way the rest of the industry is thinking. So you need to know what they're doing, but um, uh, think differently. And if you follow those six prescription points, uh, you, you'll come away uh, 10 years from now. And by the way, Jack and I, Jack's gonna look the same. We're gonna come back <laughs> together in 10 years and, and uh, see, we're gonna score ourselves on whether this really turned out as we prescribed. Let's put it on the calendar, Ted. All right, done. Tom and Zayla, back to you guys. Ted, Ted, let me just echo Jack's thanks and, and uh, uh, for a really valuable program. And, and Jack, uh, you know, you may have a future in webinars here, but, uh, 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 I, our audience is going to have a chance to tell us what they think. There's going to be a short survey at the end of the call. But uh, again, thanks for the thanks to the audience for joining us today, uh, and we hope that you're all healthy and safe. And that's the end of our call. Thank you very much. Okay. Hold well on. Thank you. Thank you.